I'm going to express here is very clear that without good and bad, you know, you don't live in the real world, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, even the Buddha has to deal with this, mm -hmm. okay? So, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious that, well, first of all, let me say, uh, this, this chapter that we're going to be studying today uh, is the 12th chapter of, of the uh, 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 theoretical uh, uh, first half of the Lotus Sutra, right? The bottom line, though, is that it's very, when the Daishonin starts talking about it with just pulling out little bits, it becomes kind of like, huh, because you don't have the context, all right? So the first thing I wanna talk about is the reality of what I'm experiencing. And what I'm experiencing is something that uh, anybody could experience. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in reality, you know, it's reflective of my nature as well, you know? So uh, I'm going to um, focus, where's my, here it is. I'm gonna focus on uh, bringing this point out very clearly, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, we have 10 worlds, right? Yeah. Okay, and the uh, first four are what? Uh, Do you remember, remember to be able to just whip them out? Hell, used to be. Animals. We used to say, yeah, yeah. Uh, hell, and animals. Uh, animals. Angries. Uh, no, angry is four. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, hell, hunger, animality, hungry spirits. Oh, hell, oh, hunger, hungry. hungry spirits, oh, pardon me, oh, An animals. animals. When, when we first started years ago, it was hell, hunger, animality, and anger, right? Uh -huh. Rapture, tranquility, which was the realm of human and the realm of, uh, of, of gods, okay? Mm. Uh, heavenly beings. So the reality is that the reason my voice is the way it is is because uh, I scream sometimes when I get excited or when I get very angry. <laughs> so... Uh, I'm here to acknowledge the reality that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually an asura, all right? Okay, which isn't a human being, mm -hmm. okay? I'm with, what I'm identifying with is now the 10 worlds, right? Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to qualify is that the unique nature of the Devadatta chapter is that, first of all, you'll find out that uh, only in the translation of the Lotus Sutra into Chinese, from Sanskrit that Kumera Jaiva did, okay, has Devadatta split out as a separate chapter. Normally this is, a, in the other two extant translations of the Lotus Sutra, uh, the Devada, what the content of the Devadatta chapter is actually included in the uh, Treasure Tower chapter. Okay, so this is kind of an extension of what we just finished doing, which was the Treasure Tower mm -hmm. chapter. Mm -hmm. And as you know, getting through all 20 points took us like two hours, mm -hmm. three weeks ago. Okay, so here I am and I'm having to, so I'm gonna go back through a little bit of the Treasure Tower chapter. I've already highlighted a bunch of stuff. If I decide I need to, I can read right from the, uh, uh, the, the chapter, the, from the Lotus Sutra itself. Uh, but the Daishonin is going to make some very clear distinctions versus what is being said uh, in the translation from Kumera Jaiva, okay, from the standpoint of the content. So the Kumara Jaiva's uh, 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 Lotus Sutra, it's 28 chapters long, is really the teaching of Shakyamuni, or that's what it's, that's pr what it's presented as, right? Yeah. The orally transmitted teachings is for the latter day of the law, Okay, and it has an extrapolation that doesn't exist in the Lotus Sutra except hidden in the depths. All right, because all of this is nothing more than ex a further ex expression, a broadened expression of Namyoho Rengekyo, okay, which didn't exist until the fifth 500 year period, right? Mm. Okay, so I thought, what would be a good way to explain uh, that the three poisons, you know, hell, hunger, animality, uh, pardon me. The three poisons are a greed, anger, and foolishness. Pardon me. Mm -hmm. You know, that those are actually part of life and a good thing. Because most people will go through their point, their, the periods of time of their practice. They're trying to perfect their life somehow. Right. They're trying to become good people. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. And 
Buddhahood has nothing to do with being a good person. It has to do with a, being a correct person, mm -hmm. a perceiving the truth, mm -hmm. so that you can teach people how to perceive the truth. Yes. Mm -hmm. If it's to, perceive, to teach them how to be good people, good luck, because that's not the essential nature of everyone. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, there are good people. There are people in the fifth realm, even the sixth realm, mm -hmm. okay? But not all of us are blessed with that kind of a, a, of, of a natural inclination based on genetics, based on history, based on all kinds of different things, okay? So looking up the three poisons, which is, you know, what I just talked about, greed, anger, and foolishness, I decide, well, if I'm gonna get that, I shouldn't get it just from the dictionary. Uh, what I'll do is I'll look up, where does it say three poisons? Does that I shonen talk about the three poisons in the orally transmitted teachings, okay? So I go to the uh, 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 Nichiren Buddhism Library, the online version, and I just do a search on orally transmitted teachings for the three poisons, okay? And so we've already discussed these po several of these points already because they're in previous chapters or whatever. But I'm gonna go through all of them, okay? Because they all contain essential teaching, all right? So, uh, first of all, three poisons uh, from the lifespan ch of the thus come one. This is chapter 27, uh, uh, seven important points when we get into each chapter has, it's, it's at the end of the, of, of the OTT. So um, I'm gonna start out by talking about from the lifespan chapter, he says, um, pardon me. All right. What did I just do? Let me go backwards. Here we go, there. All right, okay. From, from, from the, from the uh, orally transmitted teachings, lifespan chapter, it says, <clears throat> for this reason, this is gonna be like kind of just in a, without context, but the, the point is what it says. For this reason, taking the highly effective medicine of the wonderful law will relieve us of the sufferings inflicted by earthly desires, the three poisons, of greed, anger, and foolishness. The votaries of the Lotus Sutra who chant Nam Myoho Rengekyo do not accept the alms of those who slander the law, and thereby they are relieved of the sickness of greedy desires. The votaries of the Lotus Sutra, which are all of us chanting Nam Myoho Rengekyo in the latter day, right? With faith in Nichiren's teaching. Uh, the votaries of the Lotus Sutra, though they are cursed, uh, pardon me, Though they are cursed uh, and abused, practice forbearance and thereby are relieved of the sickness of anger. The votaries of the Lotus Sutra know that they will attain Buddhahood for, as the Sutra said, says, such, person, such a person assuredly and without doubt will attain the Buddha way, chapter 21, supernatural powers. And they are thereby relieved of the earthly desires associated with foolishness. This highly effective medicine is thus the sweet dew that ensures attainment of Buddhahood in the latter day of the law. Those three poisons are the, the sweet dew that assure attainment of Buddhahood in the latter day of the law. Now, Nichiren and his followers who chant Nam Myoho Rengekyo are the original possessors, are the original possessors of this highly effective medicine. All right, so that means that no one preceding us, as it relates to being teachers of the law, uh, would have experienced this, all right? Mm -hmm. So going to then the next thing here, three poisons of greed, anger, and foolishness that are a part of each and every one of the living beings. This is from chapter 21, uh, all, 28 of, of, uh, all 28 chapters of the Lotus Sutra are Nam Myoho Rengekyo. The first one was from one, page 131. This is from page 234. It says, uh, as to the benefits, uh, pardon me, let me go a little bit. The record of the orally transmitted teaching says, regarding this chapter, in the preceding chapter, 
those in the assembly were informed about the lifespan of the thus come one who is originally and eternally endowed with the three bodies. And therefore, in this chapter, they learn to believe in and understand this Buddha who is eternally endowed with the three bodies. That is, the chapter concerns the distinctions and benefits that come to one through such belief and understanding. As to the benefits, the distinction here is made clear that earthly desires associated with the three poisons of greed, anger, and foolishness that are a part of each and every one of the living beings mm. in the, of the ten worlds will now, just as they are, become the benefits of the wonderful law. These benefits are none other than nam myoho that exists in our original existences. So this has always been there, this poison, these three poisons are there they, to block and obscure your capacity to perceive the truth of your life, mm -hmm. okay? And that's why in the last chapter, he talked about the fact that he, he, he pre-quoted the Devadatta chapter by saying anybody that can believe what the Devadatta chapter says and embrace it fully, absolutely is assured of Buddhahood because all of this is counterintuitive. It's basically saying that without these three poisons, we can't attain Buddhahood. We'll never become aware of Buddhahood. We'll just get up to human realm, heavenly realm, and we'll stop there. Or maybe we'll get the voice here or cause awakened one, but, or even Bodhisattva, but we'll never understand we always have been Buddhas all along. And that the teaching has been trying to show us that all along, okay? Uh, then we go to the third one that comes here. It says, stands for the three poisons of greed, anger, and foolishness. The word bodies represent the bodies. Okay, he's going to, page 182. It says, generally speaking, concerning, okay, again, we may say regarding the 33 bodies or bodily transformations that if one is endowed with the three bodies of each of the 10 worlds, this constitutes 30 bodies. And if the original three bodies are then added in, it, it, uh, we have a total of 33 bodies. It's like Shakyamuni kind of enlightenment, right? Generally speaking, concerning 30 or th three uh, multiplied by 10, the number three stands for the three categories of action, namely actions of the body, mouth, and mind or physical, verbal, and mental actions, while the number 10 stands for the 10 worlds, which includes everybody, all right? From, from people in hell, all the way to people of, of supreme perfect enlightenment. The number three of 33 may stand for the three poisons of greed, anger, and foolishness. The word bodies represents the bodies of all living beings. When, now, when Nichiren and his followers chant nam myoho renge they are enjoying the benefits of the 33 bodies or bodily transformations of becoming a Buddha in their present form. All right. Um, come on, go. Backwards, please. There we go. Uh, and then... Now the practitioners of... This is from the Dehrani chapter. <clears throat> Now the practitioners of Lotus Sutra become us because they transform the three poisons of greed, anger. And what this is going to qualify is what do we do? How do we, what, what, what do we do with those three poisons in reality mm -hmm. in this process of becoming a Buddha in our present form? Are those three bodies separate from higher realms? Mm -hmm. No, we flip them. We transform them, okay, into their enlightened state from their deluded state. Mm -hmm. Greed, anger, and foolishness is delusion, mm -hmm. okay? Okay, so this is page 184 of uh, the OTT. It says, <laughs> okay, now, that the pra now the practitioners of the Lotus Sutra, because they transform the three poisons of greed, anger, and foolishness into the three virtues of the Dharma body, wisdom, and emancipation are not to be identified with the god Sambo or Kojin. For persons who have no faith in the Lotus Sutra, Kojin is what this name implies, a rough god who awakens demons. But when he is in the presence of practitioners of the Lotus Sutra, 
he acts as a guardian deity. So here's the whole thing. We, okay, this just clarified, we are actually transforming those three poisons. We're not getting rid of them. They're a part of the original state. They're a part of all living beings, okay? All right, so then we go to page 62, the Lotus Sutra, then the mind ground uh, of earthly desires that is beset by the three poisons of greed, anger, and foolishness. This is from the parable on the medicinal herbs, which we read some time ago, it's chapter five. It says, the record of the orally transmitted teaching says, belief in the heart of the Lotus Sutra is the seeds. And when one enters the enlightenment of the true aspect of all phenomena, when one enters into the enlightenment of Namyoho Rengekyo, then one re achieves the fruit of Buddhahood. Medicine represents the mind of the living beings in the nine worlds. The mind that is devoted to the provisional teachings is, con is comparable to a poison plant. But when one encounters the Lotus Sutra, then the mind ground of earthly desires that is beset by the three poisons of greed, anger, and foolishness is planted with the seeds of, complete, of the complete enjoyment of the three bodies of a Buddha. And awakening to this fact, awakening to this fact, which comes from study and chanting Daimoku, not just from hearing words mm -hmm. and understanding the meaning. Now when Nietzsche and, and uh, pardon me, <clears throat> Now when Nietzsche and his followers apply this medicine of the wonderful law to the plants of earthly desires, this is in effect a way of saying in parable form that earthly desires are enlightenment because, you know, what led to enlightenment are three poisons, right? And that the sufferings of birth and death are nirvana, that these three poisons from that are initially the cause of suffering ultimately become the cause for enlightenment. A commentary, vol volume five of words and phrases says, a parable is that which enlightens and instructs. Thus the parable of the medicinal herbs is a, a fa in fact about us, who are we, who are the votaries of the Lotus Sutra. Okay, so there's, being an Asura is not such a bad thing if you're an Asura. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Uh, then we all go to uh, the emergence of the treasure tower chapter 20 important points page 92 all, sh all share the light of the three poisons greed anger and foolishness this is herein referred to as here we go the record of the orally transmitted teaching says these the four quarters north south east and west the four intermediate quarters, northeast, northwest, southeast, and southwest, and up and down constitute the ten directions, which are equivalent to the ten worlds. The living beings of the ten worlds all share the light of the three poisons, greed, anger, and foolishness. This is here referred to as the light from the tuft of white hair. Remember, this is the last thing we just read, mm -hmm. for the tuft of the white hair between the Buddha's eyebrows. It is the wisdom embodied in the single mind of the middle way. Now when Nietzsche and his followers chant Nam Myoho Rengekyo, they are shining this light upon all, ten, all the ten worlds simultaneously. This is because it is the bright light of the true aspect of all phenomena. This is because it is the bright light of Nam Myoho Rengekyo. All right, almost done here. <clears throat> Then from uh, the former affairs of the Bodhisattva Medicine King, Medicine King, chapter six important points, page 175. Okay, uh, boom. the record of the orally transmitted teaching says the words a person here includes everyone from those on the highest level who have attained the fruits of Buddhahood mm -hmm. down to those on the lowest, the offenders in hell. Illness here, illness refers to the three poisons of greed, anger, and foolishness. Fundamental earthly desires possessed even by Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Neither old age refers to neither old age refers to Shakyamuni Buddha, and nor death refers to the Bodhisattvas who emerged from the earth and their followers, the Bodhisattvas of the earth. He creates a separation there between Shakyamuni and the Bodhisattvas of the earth. 
This passage is preached for the sake of living beings in the present age, after the Buddha has passed away. Accordingly, the word illness in such a, in such a case refers to slandering of the law. Hence, those persons who accept and uphold this sutra will without doubt find their illness wiped out at once. Now, Nietzsche and his followers who chant nam myoho renge are just such persons. So, so far, the theme has been in reality that all living beings are the same. And all living beings are born with the three poisons and the potential for Buddhahood. Okay, so now here's the important thing that I want to make as a point of why I'm reading all this. If we go through daily life making differentiations, being racist in any way, uh, discerning uh, intelligence, and discerning sexuality, uh, discerning uh, gender, mm -hmm. discerning anything that makes us different from all others, we're going down the wrong path because this is, you're not believing the teaching at that point, okay? The teaching is clearly saying there's no difference between anything or anyone. They are all fundamentally uh, 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 em emanations of nam myoho renge -kyo. Do you understand? So there are a lot of people that think that they believe and yet they still have prejudicial views. Okay, then they don't believe. Okay, mm -hmm. and then they wonder why they have the effect of slander. They're creating the slander because they're not accepting the teaching. Yeah. This doesn't come, I'm not saying all of this because I'm so smart. I'm saying this because I've read this over and over and over again, and I'm convinced if it says it that many times, it must be the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now once I open myself to that truth, I realize, oh shit, that really is the truth. Mm -hmm. And so now every time I get in front of the Gohanzan, and I'm full of shit. The tenth world comes up and says, Tom, you're full of shit. And I'm able to change my life condition correctly rather than suffer and continue to suffer under the delusion that something else has, effect, has affected me karmically. Because mm -hmm. I'm responsible for everything that occurs in my life. Because I'm the one that experiences it the way I experience it. So if I experience it with joy and wisdom, I'm the one that created that joy and wisdom, right. okay? Right. If, I, if, I, if I experience it with uh, downtrodden uh, victimization or uh, uh, a lack of self-respect for my own nature, then, you know, I'm the one that imposed myself as to not be of the 10th world, okay? And that is a slander of the law, okay? Because to not believe in the teaching is slander. Mm. All right. So that's why I always add to believe in the teaching of Nichiren is really so important. You have to not just know this and yeah, it makes sense. And it's like nice mind candy because we could go to church or some shit like that. OK, and have the same kind of effect. We walk out of there feeling awful godlike, awful good like awful huh, benevolent like. OK, but the wisdom that's the thing that makes it concrete and real, okay? Rather than uh, happy talk. Right. Would not be there to keep the glue together. You could not convey it and transfer it to anyone. You could never be a teacher of the law because you don't really believe the teaching of the law, okay? We're almost through. Um, Okay, uh, that, that one was from Bodhisattva Medicine King chapter point one, uh, 175. All right, here we go. Beings, here we go. In another sense, we may say that when living beings freely send forth their words and voices, this is the case of taking it upon themselves to preach without being asked. Exactly what I'm doing right now. Taking it, taking it upon themselves to preach, we may say, refers to refers even to the voices and cries of the wrongdoers being punished by the wardens of hell, to the famished cries of the hungry spirits, or to the voices of all living beings as moment by moment they are beset by the three poisons of greed, anger, and foolishness. All these voices, in essence, are nam myoho renge kyo because there's not a single one of those conditions that doesn't have the potential to lead to uh, supreme perfect enlightenment okay so 
Whatever you're expressing, you're already on the path and you already have the capacity. He says, the heavenly drums are the five characters of Myoho Rengekyo, the essential teaching and the theoretical teaching. Heavenly refers to the highest principle, which is comparable to heaven. Take it upon oneself to preach refers to the preaching of the law by the Buddha of limitless joy. Didn't we qualify that before? That when we preach Nam Myoho Rengekyo, we are Buddhas of limitless joy. The original Buddha of limitless joy is the original teacher. As disciples of the original teacher, just like in the last chapter it said we're, you know, the, the, the Dharma king, Shakyamuni. It's important because we're all the children of the Dharma king, Shakyamuni. And that's not a conflict to say that Shakyamuni is all that in a bag of chips. It's to basically say that's what enables us to be Buddhist. That's what the sun, we, we become Dharma kings ourselves. All right? Right? Okay. So on the words and phrases, volume three says, the words and phrases states that this is a symbolic of one who takes it upon oneself to preach without being asked. Is referring, it refers to the opening of the expedient means chapter where the Buddha arises from his samadhi and addresses Sheri Putra, delivering praise now in extended language, now in abbreviated form. He also uses the auspicious omens of, the, of this land and other lands, as well as things descri des describable in words and indescribable. Sometimes he speaks of the reality, sometimes of the wisdom to understand it. These, reality and wisdom, Kyochi Myogo, are the root and foundation of the entire sutra, which is fusing with the Gohonzon in the latter day, right? are the root and foundation of the entire sutra because the sutra is there to show you that you're already a Buddha. The crux of the five periods, pardon me, the, the interpretation of the Shonen in the latter day is that you're already the Buddha. Sometimes he speaks of the reality, sometimes of the wisdom to understand it. These reality and wisdom are the root and foundation of the entire sutra, the crux of the five periods of preaching. Therefore, this matter must not be approached lightly. What is What in the passage of, of commentary here is called the root and foundation of the entire sutra, the crux of the five periods of teaching, this is Nam Myoho Rengekyo. So it always keeps coming back to the prime point of the original state, mm -hmm. which is Kuan, which is without beginning. If we're all eternal, then we're also without beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Very deep, but very factual thing. And luckily, science is now proving that the Big Bang Theory is, uh, might have occurred, but it is not the beginning. There, there was there was universe that existed prior to the Big Bang, okay? And I think this is the last one. Uh, no, it's the next to the last one. No, it is the last one. Yes. There we go. For this reason, uh, in this chapter, the word shu, seed or species in the passage, because only the thus come one understands the species, the form, the substance, the nature of these living beings, embodies two revelations, those of shuri, shurishu, or seeds of similar species, and though and sotaishu, sota or seeds of their opposites. The term seeds of their opposite means that the three poisons of greed, anger, and foolishness are none other than the three virtues of the Dharma body, wisdom, and emancipation. In the term shurishu, or seeds of similar species, the first shu, or seeds, refers to the ten worlds and the three thousand realms. The word rui, or similar, refers to the mutual possession of the ten worlds. And the second shu refers to nam myoho rengekyo. This is the makeup of the term shurishu. The various plants and trees of the 10 worlds and the 3,000 realms are of many individual kinds, but in the end, they are all simply this one seed or species of nam myoho rengekyo. The poison of the poisonous herbs ceases to exist. These plants and trees are clean and pure, and hence they are called medicinal herbs. So, the way we purify our lives is to perceive the truth and to not make distinctions between other living beings 
or disqualify them in any way because no matter what state they're in, we should see that the basis of their life, the nam yo ho gekyo is still in them, okay? And have mercy and compassion for them as such rather than ever feeling like, who, okay? Because that's a natural reaction to ick, right? Natural ick, you know, natural reaction to ick is, ooh, okay? So if we can get rid of that kind of prejudicial perception and see the bright light of the truth, then we don't have ick anymore. As long as we can see and feel ick, then we have ick. Mm-hmm. Get it? Okay. So uh, <clears throat> now I'm going to go ahead and read some real quick. We're going to talk about Maitreya is, you know, Ajita. Uh, he's, a, he's a bodhisattva uh, that's uh, supposed to be predicted to uh, uh, succeed Shakyamuni in a future, uh, as a future Buddha. His also name is Ajita, meaning invincible. I'm not going to give you any more of that than that. I'm just, if you don't know who Maitreya is or Manjushri, I'm, you need to know because they're going to be mentioned. All right, next one, Asura. I t- called myself Asura. The definition of Asura is a type of demon in Indian mythology, contentious and belligerent. (laughs) Asuras fight continually with the gods. Buddhist scriptures often regard Asuras as enemies of the gods, especially of Chakra and Indra. Asuras are one of the eight kinds of non-human beings that are included in the Lotus Sutra in the introduction chapter, right? The word of the world of Asuras is counted as one of the six paths or the six lower states of existence among the ten worlds. So it's one of the ten worlds. The next one here is going to be anger, which is a more clarified aspect of the what an Asura is represented in the ten worlds. In Buddhism, one of the three poisons or the three sources of vice and suffering, and the, the other two being greed and foolishness. In Buddhism, anger refers particularly to malice born of hatred and is regarded as a great obstacle to Buddhist practice. So we really got to work on If we're hating, we're not seeing things the way that we should. We should be chanting Daimoku to bring the 10th world out in our life, in our, into our mind, to awaken the mind core. It is seen as preventing one's heart from turning to goodness and destroying the root uh, the good roots of benefit accumulated through Buddhist practice. So we can practice all we want to correctly, and if we still allow ourselves to destroy that benefit, that fortune we've created, it goes. We don't keep it. We don't get to be good and we don't get to be we don't get to be good and bad. In other words, if we've okay, let me say it again. In Buddhism, one of the three poisons are the three sources of vice and suffering, the other two being greed and foolishness. In Buddhism, anger refers particularly to malice born of hatred and it is regarded as a great obstacle to Buddhist practice. Now, my anger isn't really a malice kind of an anger. It's a loss of my temper and a shortness of patience with other people that may not be blessed with the same mind that I have, okay? or people that do things that um, piss me off before I realize I karmically created the cause for that to occur. It's not them. They're just delivering first class what I made for myself. It is seen as preventing one's heart from turning to goodness, okay, from being able to do that, transform, okay, and as destroying the good roots of benefit accumulated through Buddhist practice. Tentai says in the words and phrases in the Lotus Sutra, because anger increases in intensity, uh, armed strife occurs. Buddhism emphasized the practice of uh, compassion and forbearance. And what's forbearance? Putting up with the shit and accepting it as your own. Not blaming it on other people. Not quitting, not stopping, going forward, not allowing anything to confuse you. As long as you keep chanting Daimoku, you'll always be that clarity, seeking that clarity, rather than having a good place to complain, (laughs) okay? Seeking clarity instead of, Mm. you know, 
bitching and moaning. <laughs> all right. That's how we destroy our good fortune. Yes. Seeking clarity. That's how we create indestructible good fortune. All right. Be, uh, this is um, still anger. Buddhism. Uh, the, boom. Okay. And forbearance. That's how that's what. Okay. Hang on. Almost. Okay. Manjushri. Okay. Manjushri. Okay. Which is going to be mentioned in this. Why, why is this, it, this, this chapter important? It's, be, it's because it qualifies. When, whenever I say even evil people, you notice I always hit myself in the chest pretty hard. Okay? It's only because of this part of the teaching that I didn't have to become fucking Jesus. Excuse me. <laughs> I didn't have to become Jesus to become the Buddha. Okay? Because if I would have had to become Jesus... I would have lost my, I, you know, maybe I wouldn't have lost my voice all the time. But again, I'd have never made it. And I see that in people practicing in, I won't mention names, in, in different uh, perspectives of uh, the teaching, okay? They still have not gotten that point. They're trying to become good people first so that they can then be qualified to be the Buddha. No. That has nothing to do with it. No. No. I've known a million of them. They're Titan. <laughs> so what good was it? Okay? They were very happy to judge other people's faith. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. And they viewed their own as absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. this, is, <laughs> this is a mistake. This is, this is something you need to be aware of to guard against in your own mind. Mm -hmm. Okay? Manju Shrai, who's going to be talking about the Dragon King's daughter, okay, because he's been teaching everybody, okay, do you know who M B Manju Shrai is? Manju Shrai is like the number one bodhisattva, but don't forget, these are, at the, in the latter day of the law, these are bodhisattvas of the provisional teaching of the Lotus Sutra, okay? So Manju Shrai, a bodhisattva who appears in the sutras, Mahayana sutras, as the leader of the bodhisattvas and is regarded as symbolic of the perfection of wisdom. And when he says of, uh, of the leader of the bodhisattvas, not the bodhisattvas of the earth. Mm. The leader of the bodhisattvas of the earth is not Manjushri. Mm. He's the bodhisattvas that had come to the assembly, okay, that Shakyamuni had called forth, that were disciples of Shakyamuni mm. from the former and the middle day, okay? Sutras depict him as one of the two bodhisattvas who attend Shakyamuni, the other being Samada, some, some universal worthy. <laughs> Manju Shri is generally shown on, on Buddhist art writing a lion to the, at the Buddha's left and represents the virtues of wisdom and enlightenment. Shakyamuni's right hand attendant, Bodhisattva universal worthy, shown riding a white elephant, represents the virtues, virtues of truth and practice. Now, again, this is all Mahayana Buddhism. According to, uh, part, uh, you know, this is pre lotus. Uh, according to the Flower Garland Sutra, Manjushri lives in, on Mount Clear and Cool in the east, uh, which came to be identified with Mount Wutai, and they, somebody thought they could go, go to this mountain in China, and he'd be hanging there. Not necessary. Deveshi is, a, is also, this is all Sanskrit, Hatred, dislike, anger, repugnance. Remember? Repugnance, I told you. If you see ick, that's repugnance. Okay, repugnance is when you see something and it, your nose wrinkles up. And you judge it. You're judging when you, see, when, you, when you do that, when you experience repugnance. All right? Uh, pardon me. Aversion. Aversion would be like, you know, you're so... I, would, I don't even want to be around you, okay? That's aversion, okay? Uh, and enmity. Enmity is uh, to think badly, poorly, or to disrespect without any real basis to do it. You're just basically looking at somebody and deciding that you're right and they're wrong, okay? That's enmity. That's, it's like, that's a ha the hatred, that's hatred without a reason, Hatred without reason. Prejudice is a form of en enmity. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, de this is so hard to pronounce because it's D-V-E-S-H-A. Devsha, or anger, is one of the three poisons of the three sources of vice and suffering, the other two being 
rega, greed, and moka, amaka, foolishness. Also, see also anger, three poisons. All right, we're going right through this, guys. The eight sufferings. I have to mention this again because it helps qualify the equality of all living beings. We already read this once, the eight sufferings, the eight kinds of universal sufferings, even a Buddha ex experiences, mm. right? Mm. All right? They are the four sufferings of birth, aging, sickness, and death, mm. plus the suffering of having to part from those whom one loves, the suffering of having to meet with those whom one hates. Okay, so that capacity for delusion exists in everything, in everyone. That's why we do gongyo and chant daimoku every day to bring the realm of Buddhahood back to the top. Okay, because it starts sinking down when we don't. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, pardon me, uh, suffering and the sufferings of being unable to obtain what one desires. Okay, and the suffering arising from the five components that constitute one's body and mind, to have physical problems with your brain or your body. Uh, the eight great dragon kings, okay, the eight great dragon kings were all present in the introduction chapter, all right? One of those dudes, one of those eight great, and Manjushri has been in the, down at the bottom of the ocean, teaching them for innumerable kalpas, whatever. Also, eight dragon kings, eight dragon, eight dragon kings who assembled in the gathering where Shakyamuni preached the Lotus Sutra as described in the Sutra. By the way, where can you see the, the, the uh, Chinese character for uh, dragon king? On the Gohonzon, of course. You guys all go, it's, well, we've been seeing it forever. <laughs> to me, it's like, okay. It's to the far left in the, like the second column next, next to earthly desires. Uh, uh, the, 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 yeah, equal enlightenment. Uh, let's see, Kumara Jaiva's translation of Lotus Sutra refers to them by their Sanskrit names, Nanda, Upananda, Segera, which is the dragon king father of, of the dragon king's daughter. Uh, that we're going to read about. Vasuki, Takshaka, Anavatapta, Manasvin, and Uptalaka. I don't do uh, 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 Sanskrit very well. According to the introduction, first chapter of the Lotus Sutra, each attends the gathering accompanied by several hundred or th of thousands several hundreds of thousands of followers, okay? So these are kind of badass dudes if they've got that kind of a, a retinue. Um, Dragon King's daughter, also Dragon Girl or Nega Girl, the eight-year-old daughter of Segera, one of the eight great Dragon Kings and said to dwell in the palace at the bottom of the sea. According to the Devadatta 12th chapter of the Lotus Sutra, the dragon girl attained enlightenment when she heard Bodhisattva Manjushri uh, preach the Lotus Sutra in the dragon king's palace, okay, before she appeared in the sutra. Because the dragon king's palace is at the bottom of the ocean, and that's where Manjushri has been preaching the law for all that time. According to the Devadatta chapter 12, uh, the dragon, oh, pardon, pardon me, Preach the Lotus Sutra in the Dragon King's Palace. When Manjushri asserts that she quickly attained Buddha wisdom, Bodhisattva wisdom accumulated challenges, challenges him, saying that even Shakyamuni attained enlightenment only after fulfilling the Bodhisattva practice for many kalpas, and that she could not have become a Buddha so easily. Mm -hmm. Just then the dragon girl appears in front of the assembly and praises Shakyamuni Buddha in 14 ver lines of verse, which I would read you if you read the sutra. Uh, and praises Shakyamuni Buddha. Shariputra then, okay, so you've got uh, uh, wisdom accumulated. Bodhisattva wisdom accumulated is the disciple of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, who was in the treasure tower? Um, what, huh? Shoot. Many treasures. <laughs> Bodhisattva, he's a, he's a disciple of, of, of many treasures. Okay. 
uh, saying that even Shakyamuni, okay, just, okay, let me start again. When Manjushri asserts that she quickly attained Buddhahood, Buddha wisdom, okay, so this is the whole thing that validates what? This whole story about the Dragon King's daughter and how quickly she attained Buddhahood. What's this, what's this qualify in the Lotus Sutra? That it doesn't take countless lifetimes to become the Buddha, yeah. okay? And also, you don't have to be even human, and it doesn't matter what gender you are, okay? You don't have to be a good person. You don't, not, even, not only that, but again, it's saying that Buddhahood is not restricted from anything. It's mm. an innate aspect of all things, yes. okay? And whenever you see it not present, you're showing your own blindness yes. and you're making the cause to experience that darkness. Yes. You're putting it on you yourself. All right? Exactly. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Wisdom accumulated challenges him, saying that even Shakyamuni attained enlightenment only after fulfilling the Bodhisattva practice for many kalpas and that she could not have become a Buddha, a Buddha so easily. Yes, you can. Just then, the dragon girl appears in front of the assembly and praises Shakyamuni Buddha. Sherry Putra, the leader of the voice hearers, right, then speaks to her, saying that women are subject to the five obstacles and are incapable of attaining Buddhahood. Because at, at this point in time, they're not dissing Shakyamuni, what Shakyamuni is saying, they're dissing what Manjushri is preaching, even though Shakyamuni has said you should wait and listen and listen to what Manjushri is going to say, because he's been preaching the Lotus Sutra at four for eons. Says, uh, okay, Shari Putra speaks to her, then speaks to her, saying that women are the subject of the five obstacles that are incapable of attaining Buddhahood. At that moment, she offers a jewel to the Buddha, transforms herself into a male, and instantaneously perfects the uh, uh, the Bodhisattva practice. He then appears in a land in the to the south called Spotless World and manifests the state of Buddhahood with the 32 features and 80 characteristics of a Buddha. He practices the Lotus Sutra. Uh, uh, he preaches Lotus Sutra to, to all the living beings there. This is the clarification of what that's actually saying. The dragon, the dragon girl's enlightenment has important implications. First, it refutes the idea of the time that we, uh, of the time that women could never attain enlightenment. Okay, so if you're a woman, you're not going to get there no matter what you do. Which that I shown and said very clearly in his teaching to all of his female disciples, you're there already. You're greater than the greatest teachers. Second. It reveals that the power of the Lotus Sutra enables all people equally to attain Buddhahood in their present forms. That is, through the Lotus Sutra, people need neither practice austerities for countless kalpas, nor wait for rebirth in a different physical form. Provisional teachings hold that women must be reborn as men and then practice for innumerable kalpas in order to become Buddhas. And Again, don't forget that the Lotus Sutra, which I just was quoting from, is a provisional teaching in the latter day of the law. Okay, so it was still at a time when that rule supposedly still, you know, uh, was, was uh, valid. Okay, this is the truth. In these more than 40 years, I have not preached the truth. This is the sutra that reveals that truth, that you don't have to do countless culpas and that you can be any form, and that you can be any gender, and that everything is equal. Uh, pardon me. <clears throat> the dragon girl's changing into a man is not a condition for her Buddhahood. She has already attained Buddhahood in her female animal form at the Dragon King's palace as taught by Manjushri, which has already been qualified. The only reason she's made an appearance at this point is to... Tell wisdom accumulated, you ain't got that much wisdom accumulated. <laughs> and, mind you, and, and to tell Sherry Putra, the fact that I'm a female doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Okay? Her transformation is an expedient means 
to demonstrate her Buddhahood in a way that Sherry Putra and the others can understand, okay? It's not that that's to be taken literally, okay? The three virtues, the Dharma body, uh, wisdom and emancipation, three attributes of a Buddha. The Dharma body means the truth that the Buddha has realized or the true aspect of all phenomena, which is nam myoho renge Wisdom is the ca capacity to realize this truth as the truth, the teachings of Nichiren as the truth. And emancipation means the state of being free from the sufferings of birth and death, because you're always born birth and death in the realm of, the, in the realm of Buddhahood. You're going to the ninth consciousness when you leave this realm, mm -hmm. okay? There is a correspondence between the three virtues, the three truths, and the three Buddhas, uh, and the Buddha's three bodies. The Dharma body of the three virtues corresponds to the truth of the middle way and, the, and to the Dharma body of the three bodies. Wisdom to the truth of non-substantiality and to the reward body. And emancipation to the truth of temporary existence and to the manifested body. Tentai says that the three paths of earthly desires karma and suffering are in reality none other than the three virtues of dharma body, wisdom, and emancipation, okay? Uh, for example, Tentai states in the profound meaning of Lotus Sutra, straying from the dhar dharma body constitutes the path of suffering. There is no dharma bar body apart from the path of suffering. The true nature of the three paths is the three virtues. But when one, trans, when, when one cannot manifest the three virtues, one remains in the three paths. Okay, so I got one more here. The three poisons, greed, anger, and foolishness. We've already, we've already been talking about it from the very beginning. The fundamental evils inherent in life that give rise to human suffering. In the treatise on the great perfection of wisdom, which would be Nagarjuna, the three poisons are regarded as the source of all illusions and earthly desires. The three poisons are so-called because they pollute people's lives and work to prevent them from turning their hearts and minds to goodness. The words and phrases of the Lotus Sutra by Tentai speaks of the three poisons as the underlying cause of the three calamities of famine, war, and pestilence, stating because anger increases in intensity, armed strife occurs because greed increases in intensity, Famine arises because foolishness increases in intensity. Pestilence breaks out. Because these three calamities occur, earthly desires grow more numerous and powerful than ever. The false views and false views increasingly flourish. In the simile and parable third chapter of the Lotus Sutra, Shakyamuni says to Sherry Putra, he, the thus come one, is born into the threefold world, a burning house, rotten and old, in order to save living beings from the fires of birth, aging, sickness, and death, care, suffering, stupidity, misunderstanding, and the three poisons, to teach and convert them and enable them to attain supreme, perfect enlightenment. Okay, so now we will go to, back to a couple of passages from the points made from the Treasure Tower chapter, because I want to emphasize this, because again, in the other two versions of the Lotus Sutra translations, this is all, all the same chapter. There's 27 chapters in those translations. All right. It says, uh, let's see. I think I... S here, 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 here. Pardon me. I, I remember why I got it here. All right. Point from point seven on on uh, page ninety one of the Treasure Tower from the OTT. Point seven on the passage: If after I be, have become a Buddha and entered extinction in the lands of the ten directions, there is any place where the Lotus Sutra is preached, then my funerary tower, in order that I may listen to the Sutra, will come forth and appear in that spot. To, test, to testify to the sutra and praise its excellence. And of course, we're the treasure tower, right? Mm. Okay, so mm. the record on page 92, the record of the orally transmitted teaching says, the words 10 directions refer to the 10 worlds. That, so that everything from hell to uh, Anuttara Samyak Sambodaya, Supreme Perfect Enlightenment. 
The Lotus Sutra explains the 12 length chain of causation that determines the unceasing changes that we beings undergo, the creation of our own karma by ourselves. These words, the Lotus Sutra, refer to the sounds of our own words. The words, it's excellence, tell us that excellence and non-excellence, good and bad, are not two different things. So again, what am I preaching over and over here again? It's don't see distinctions. Mm. You are making distortions to the truth and you're not believing the teaching, mm. okay? Good and bad are not two different things and that correct and incorrect are a single entity because it's either in the deluded state or the enlightened state. So we are flipping all of this stuff all the time. The That's time. how we do, we go from being common mortals to Buddhas in a single lifetime. We flip those aspects that are delusion yes. and re don't replace them. We show their true aspect, mm -hmm. yes. which is enlightened. Mm -hmm. Now, the place where Nichiren and his followers chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo may be said to be where the Buddha many treasures comes forth and makes his appearance. That's exactly what we're doing right now as we're sitting around this table. Uh, also point eight, real quick, regarding the way in which the Buddha emitted a ray of light from the tuft of white hair between eyebrows to illustrate, to illuminate the Eastern region and how it is, is also illuminated the Southern, Western nor and Northern regions as well as the four intermediate quarters and up and down. The record of the orally transmitted teaching says the four quarters, North, South, East and West, the four intermediate quarters, Northeast, South, Northwest, southeast and southwest and up and down constitute the 10 directions. They are equivalent to the 10 worlds. The living beings in the 10 worlds all share the light of the three poisons of greed, anger, and foolishness. I'll say that again. The living beings of the 10 worlds all share the light of the three poisons, greed, anger, and foolishness. This is here referred to as the light from the tuft of the white hair between the Buddha's eyebrows. It is the wisdom embodied in the single mind of the middle way. Now when Nichiren and his followers chant nam myoho renge they are shining this light upon the 10 worlds simultaneously. This is because it is the bright light of the true aspect of all phenomena, of nam myoho renge um, Okay, now, and last but, last but not least, to point 13. Uh, page 96. Point 13, on the passage, for the sake of the Buddha way, in innumerable, uh, in immeasurable numbers of lands, from the beginning until now, I have widely preached many sutras, and among them, this sutra is foremost. If one can uphold this uh, sutra, then one will be upholding the Buddha's body. Okay. The record of the orally transmitted teaching says to uphold the Lotus Sutra mm -hmm. is to uphold belief in the fact that our bodies are the Buddha's body, which means that you believe the teaching as it's written, as, it, as, it's, as it's being taught. You don't make distinctions, mm -hmm. okay? To uphold the Lotus Sutra is to uphold belief in the fact that our bodies are the Buddha's body. The, the one word soku, or then, which also means identical, indicates that living beings and the Buddha are not two different things. First, uphold, in the phrase, if one can uphold, this sutra stands for ordinary mortals. The entity to be upheld is the five characters of Myoho Renge Kyo, the entity, okay? We speak of this as upholding the Buddha's body because each and every word of the Lotus Sutra is the golden colored body of the Buddha. To uphold the body of the Buddha at the top of page 97 means to uphold the belief, okay? And when I'm saying to uphold the belief, that means that you're not only embracing this teaching, but you've taken it as fact and you base your life on it and you try and share it with other people. To uphold the body of the Buddha means to uphold the belief that outside of our own bodies, there is no Buddha. We are the only place that the Buddha nature exists. 
us living beings, okay, that are that are uh, be, uh, uh, that are po you know have to endure the suffering of the three poisons of greed, anger, and foolishness. That is ordinary mortals mm. at Risoku or the stage of being a Buddha in theory. We're talking about the six stages of practice now, right? Okay. Or at the stage of being a Buddha in the theory are not different from the Buddha of Kukyo Soku or the stage of ultimate enlightenment. They are identical. It's the deluded state or the enlightened state. They're just going to flip from deluded to enlightened. They're not going to change. They're already identical. The word Soku identical indicates the fact that the first Soku, that of being a Buddha in, the, in theory, and the last soka, being a Buddha of absolute uh, perfect enlightenment, are no different from one another. Okay, so again, guys, no distinctions. All right? And then again, since we're that close, the record of the old, 44 to 14, one who upholds the Lotus Sutra should uphold it with the understanding that one will encounter difficulties. And the attainment of Buddhahood refers to in the, uh, that, and the attainment of Buddhahood referred to in the words this way, one will quickly attain the unsurpassed Buddha way. This is now what Nichiren and his followers attain when they chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. Now we're going to go on to the, um, pardon me, 12th chapter, Devadatta, which starts on page 100, eight important points. Whew. Damn. I could pull this off. because I know you guys are going to understand everything I say now. I'll wait. Was, are there any questions? No, no. It's all clear, right? No. You can hear my voice. Yeah, yeah it's getting stressed because I get excited because I'm an asura. I'm a, you know, it's in my nature. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank goodness I married a double Leo. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Chapter 12, Devadatta, eight important points. Point one, concerning Devadatta. Volume eight of words and phrases says, so Tantai says, his original state is pure and cool, but in manifested form, he showed himself as fever of heavenly beings. Now he's talking about Manjushri, okay? The record of the orally transmitted teaching says, Devadatta in his original state is the Bodhisattva Manjushri. Therefore, his original state is described as pure and cool. And we wouldn't normally associate that with Devadatta, who is the ultimate evil, evil dude. Okay? but he's actually the original teacher of, of, of Shakyamuni. Uh, therefore, his original state is described as pure and cool. In his manifested form, he is called Devadatta. Hence, it is said that he showed himself as fever of heavenly beings. <coughs> pure and cool is indicative of water and stands for the principle of the sufferings of birth and death are none other than nirvana. Fever of heavenly beings is indicative of fire and stands for the principle of earthly desires are none other than enlightenment. Now when Nichiren and his followers chant nam myoho renge kyo they are showing that earthly desires are enlightenment and that the sufferings of birth and death are nirvana. Devadatta is another name for myoho renge kyo In a past existence, he was a seer named Asita, not to be confused with Maitreya Ajita, Asita. Mm. The seer Asita is another name for Myoho, or Wonderful Law. Mm. The syllable A in a Asita means not or without. The law that is with the law without self is Myoho, the Wonderful Law. This volume eight of words and phrases says, one takes the law that is without self and cleanses living beings with it. 
The seer Asita is another name for 3,000 realms, uh, pardon me, is another name for the 3,000 worlds of the Dharma realm. Mm. Therefore, it is described as being without self. You should think about this principle of 3,000 realms in a single moment of life. Okay, so what did that just say? There's no distinction between evil and goodness. If, 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 if again, Devadatta is Myoho Rengekyo, okay, that means that evil is not really evil. It's distorted truth. All right? All right. So you're with me on that part? I'm yes. going to read it again. Yes. Through The record of the orally transmitted teaching says, Devadatta in his original state is Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva Manjushri. Therefore, his original state is described as pure and cool. In his manifested form, he is called Devadatta. Hence, it is said that he showed himself as fever of heavenly beings. Pure and cool is indicative of water and stands for the principle that the sufferings of birth and death are none, are none other than nirvana. Fever of heavenly beings is indicative of fire and stands for the principle that earthly desires are none other than enlightenment. So those two things that seem completely opposite on both sides are the same. That's what they come from. Is indicative of fire and, and, and the principle of earthly desires that are none other, none other than enlightenment. First line of page 101. Now, when Nichiren and his followers chant Nam Myoho Rengekyo, they are showing that earthly desires are enlightenment and the sufferings of birth and death are nirvana. How? Because we transform our lives from those of being people dwelling in the nine worlds to people dwelling in the true aspect of all phenomena, okay? We become Buddhas. Now when Nichiren and his followers chant nam myoho Rengekyo, they are showing that earthly desires, us common mortals are filled with them, right? Mm. Our enlightenment, that's the only way, we, only in the world of desire can we find, the, attain that state of enlightenment. It's the only place that exists. Mm -hmm. The Sahe world and the sufferings of birth and death are nirvana because that's what leads us to, you know, pure, uh, correct understanding. Mm. Devadatta is another name for Myoho Rengekyo. In a past existence, he was a seer. The seer named a seer Asita is another name for Myoho, the wonderful law. The syllable A in Asita means not or without. The law without self. Now, what would that indicate? Is Myoho. What's Myoho? Mystic law. Yeah. What's mystic law? And, you know. Can I explain? Yeah, cannot explain unchanging principle, a yeah. law, right? Mm. The law without self. So, did Nichiren create? No. Nam Myoho Rengekyo? No, it is the original state. He, he brought it forth in his own life so that he could perceive it, so that he could leave a teaching to teach everyone else to make them equal to him. All right? The law without self is Myoho, or the wonderful law. Thus, volume eight of words and phrases says, one takes the law that is without self and cleanses living beings with it. No Myoho Rengekyo, and allows everybody to transform from evil to purity. All right? The seer Asita is another name for 3,000 worlds, uh, the 3,000 worlds in a, of the Dharma realm. Therefore, it is described as being without self because the Dharma realm includes everything. It's not just one thing that possesses it and it's his or hers or theirs. You should think about this principle of 3,000 realms in a single moment of life because since it applies to everything, that's why you can't make distinctions or you're not believing the teaching, okay? And you're slandering the law, frankly speaking. Now you go chant Daimoku, you're gonna go wash all that dirt off every time you do it. But that's why you must continue to sit in front of the Gohan Sun and chant Daimoku. You never get to the point where I've chanted enough. Mm -hmm. I really know all this stuff backwards and <laughs> forwards. No problem, that isn't the deal, all right? Point two. On the passage at that time, there was a seer who came to the king and said, 
I have a great vehicle text called the Sutra of the Lotus uh, uh, of the Wonderful Law. If you will never disobey me, I will expound it for you. This is talking about the king that was in search of a great law and, you know, a seer came and said, I'll tell you what. And then the king served him for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. Okay. The record of the orally transmitted teaching says, with regard to this expounding of the Lotus Sutra, one should understand the meaning of the passage. If you will never disobey me, I will expound it for you to be instead of read that way, to read it this way. You never disobey me, and so you are qualified to expound it. The character for if can also be read as the pronoun you. What is the significance of that? Let me go ahead and read the next paragraph, and then I'll come back and ask the same question. Commenting on this in the eight, uh, volume eight of words and phrases, Tentai says, the king will receive the teaching and honor and practice it. Now Nichiren's followers chant, chant nam myoho renge They do not disobey him, and so they are qualified to expound the law. The Sira Sita here represents nam myoho renge So now transpose all of that back one paragraph. One should understand the meaning of the passage. If you will never disobey me, I will expound it for you to be you original disciples of me, the original teacher. Okay. You never disobey me. So you are identical to me. Okay. That's a, it's again, this is the, the, Bodhisattvas of the earth. That's why he's saying you should, in the latter day, you should not read it the way it was written for the former in the middle day. You, now, nam myoho renge exists. Mm. Now, the true teaching has finally emerged from the depths, hidden in the depths of the lifespan chapter. Mm. It's the third doctrine. Like I said, it's a, it's a different teaching than the teaching that's on the surface of the Lotus Sutra. And what he's qualifying here is that the original disciples of the original teacher are whom? The bodhisattvas of the earth. That's why Shakyamuni doesn't leave with them. He continues to stay with his crew when we disappear in chapter 23. We don't appear until chapter 16. We don't need to hear all this other stuff that's being taught to the assembly. We helped write the book. Okay? So again, you never disobey me because what's significant about bodhisattvas of the earth? If they really are bodhisattvas of the earth, all my leaders that went Titan were not bodhisattvas of the earth, regardless of how many millions of Daimoku they chanted. What's significant about bodhisattvas of the earth? They never go Titan. They never dis, uh, disparage their practice in any lifetime. In any lifetime, they have taken a vow. They come. The only reason they're in the Sahe world is because of that vow. They always uphold their vow. That's what he means by, since you never disobey me, you qualify to enter the thus come one's room, to put on the thus come one's robe, to, uh, to put, sit in the thus come one's seat, mm -hmm. and to preach the, 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 the correct teaching and make distinction, di distinctions for the sake of the others. Mm -hmm. Okay? We're true Buddhas. Mm -hmm. Get it? True Buddhas ne <coughs> never disobey the original teaching, the original teacher. Get it? Yes. Okay. Uh, and the character for if can also be used as pronoun you. Okay, now Nietzsche and his followers chant nam myoho renge -kyo. They do not disobey him. But we know of many that have, right? Mm. So were they followers? No. no. The they were pretenders. And, or they thought they were followers, but then they found out that they're pretenders. Or maybe they won't until the next lifetime. Okay, until they die, they got a chance to come back. They can turn, turn all of this delusion into enlightenment in a single moment of life. Sure. It only takes one single moment of life. It's not based on anything other than that, mm -hmm. a single moment of life. And so they are qualified 
to expound the law. What's that make them? Nam yoho renge kyo das kam once. Identical to the original teacher. Remember Soku, Roku, whatever I was just talking about from the treasure tower? That's what he's pre-qualifying to what this is now saying and qualifying. Okay. All right? The Sirisita here represents Nam yoho renge kyo. Okay, he's like a form, form and shadow. It's like Shakyamuni. He's always with Shakyamuni in every uh, incarnation of Shakyamuni. Here it says, let me just read the fine print. Uh, asterisk one, which was from the paragraph above. Uh, the name of Sita is translated in Ashi, as Ashi in Jap Japanese, which Nichiren interprets as without self. So this is the Daishonin's enlightenment that's being expressed here. The sentence consists of seven, uh, then there's a cross, looks like a cross. The sentence consists of seven characters. If you will never disobey me, I will expound it for you. Nietzsche reads the character for if as you and, and constructs the sentence as follows. You never disobey me. And so you are qualified to expound it. You're a Buddha of the, you're a Buddha of the original teaching, of the correct teaching, of the teaching for the latter day of the law, of the original teaching. Okay, so then point three. In, of, Okay, on the passage, at once he, the king, accompanied the seer, providing him with whatever he needed, picking fruit, drawing water, gathering fire, firewood, setting out meals, dot, dot, dot. Now, there, that, that uh, portion of that it actually extends a little bit further. He served the seer in this manner for a thousand years, all for the sake of the law. This is Shakyamuni when he was the king, right? Everybody's with me where I'm at in this what I'm talking about by now, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Working diligently, acting as a provider and seeing to it that the seer never lacked for nothing, uh, seeing that the seer lacked for nothing. The record of the orally transmitted teaching says, picking fruit applies to the earthly desire or defilement of foolishness. Drawing water applies to the earthly defilement of greed. Gathering firewood applies to the earthly defilement of anger. Setting out meals applies to the earthly defilement of arrogance. But what were the first three? They're in reverse order. Those are the three poisons. Oh. Picking fruit applies to the earthly desire or uh, uh, to the earthly desire uh, foolishness. I mean, I won't, you, you know they're all earthly desires. Make it easier to hear. Picking fruit applies to foolishness. Drawing water applies to greed. Gathering firewood applies to anger. Okay? <clears throat> In this passage, the eight kinds of services performed by the king for the seer are listed. If you read that whole thing where it goes dot, 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 there are four more things that are mentioned. Okay? <clears throat> In this passage... The eight kinds of services, and that's why I'm mentioning this so you understand why we just only mentioned four, but we're really talking about eight. In this passage, the eight kinds of services performed by the king for the seer, Asita, are listed. The king did not carry out any other actions outside of these in order to receive the transmission of Myoho Renge Kyo. Now when Nietzsche and his followers chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, they are carrying out such acts of service for a period of a thousand years. Such services represent the principle of 3,000 realms in a single moment of life. This is what is needed to overcome greed, anger, foolishness, and arrogance. Okay, so what the Daishonin is saying is all you need to do is chant Nam Yoho Rengege with faith. You don't have to do more than that. You don't have to become Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's only necessary to serve the law and to have the aspiring mind of doing so, because that took great diligence. I'd talk about Dutta, talk about all those other things we talked about in the Treasure Tower chapter, remember? Mm -hmm. All right, this is diligence, this is Dutta, this is a correct practice, right? All right, it's nothing more than faith in chanting Daimoku to the Gohonzon. Mm -hmm. Point four, we don't, have to, we don't have to be Jesus. Thank goodness. Point four, on the words, because the sewers would never make it. We don't have it in us to be Jesus. 
right? Really, we don't. It's our, our natural state is not like that. Point four, on the words, because the wonderful law was in his thoughts, he never flagged in body or mind. The record of the orally transmitted teaching says, these two words, body and mind, refer to the transmission of the teaching that our bodies and our minds are the wonderful law. Okay, are the wonderful law. We are Nam Yoho Renge Kyo. Mm. Nichiren and his followers chant Nam Yoho Renge Kyo and thus attain Buddhahood in their present form because we understand the true teaching that we are true teachers. We are the, 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 the uh, correct teaching. We are disciples of the original teacher. We are Nam Yoho Renge Kyo. Mm. We're one with the law. Okay. Uh, they and his followers and and thus attain Buddhahood in their present forms. Never flagging in body or mind refers to the embodiment of the principle of three thousand realms in a single moment of life. Those steps, those processes, those six stages of practice that we're able to go through, all of them are included in that process of three thousand realms manifesting, right? Point five, on the passage, Manjra Shri said, when I was in the ocean, I constantly expounded the Lotus Sutra of the wonderful law alone. In other words, he wasn't with Shakyamuni. Okay. The record of the orally transmitted teaching says, I refers to Manjra Shri. The ocean refers to the ocean of the sufferings of birth and death. The word alone or only corresponds to that in the passage, there is only the law of the one vehicle, nam yo ho rin there, there is no other law. All other laws are configuration. They come from that one law, all right? That's why we call it uh, true. There is, on, or the, there is only the law of the one vehicle, chapter two expedient means. The word constantly or always corresponds to that in the passage, I am always here preaching the law. Chapter 16, Lifespan. Myoho Rengeko is the words and sounds of the Dharma realm, of everything is Nam Myoho Rengeko. It's never absent. It's always present, okay? Everybody's with me, right? Yes. All right, the passage refers to Nichiren and his followers who now chant nam myoho renge kyo The ocean of sufferings of birth and death is none other than the great ocean of the true aspect of reality. I represents the wisdom of the Dharma realm, which is personified in Manjushri. Okay, point six. On the passage, there is the daughter of the dragon king, Segera, or Segara. Uh, who has just turned eight. Her wisdom has keen roots and she is good at understanding the root activities and deeds of living beings. She has the wisdom to perceive the truth. She has mastered the Dairain Dairanais, uh, that is, has gained the power to memorize the Buddhist teaching, has been able to accept and embrace all the storehouse of profound secrets preached by the Buddha, has entered deep into meditation thoroughly grasped the doctrines, and in the space of an instant, instant, conceived the desire for Bodhi and reached the level of no regression. What would be that be, the level of no, no regression? It'd be the first, 51st of the 52 stages Shakyamuni, or that uh, Tentai preached from the Makashikan. Uh, <clears throat> here, eloquence, her, pardon me, her eloquence knows no hindrance, and she thinks of living beings with compassion as though they were her own children. She is fully endowed with blessings, and when it comes to conceiving in mind and expounding by mouth, she is subtle, wonderful, comprehensive, and great, kind, compassionate, benevolent, yielding. She is gentle and refined in will, capable of attaining bodhi. <clears throat> Manjushri is answering a question from uh, wisdom accumulated saying, do you know anybody that's actually uh, attained Buddhahood uh, like he's talking so, you know, so quickly? And he goes, yeah, I, I can give you one good example. And that's when he starts to talk to, about the Dragon King's daughter. Mm -hmm. Bottom of page 103, the record of the orally transmitted teaching says, 
Age 8 is symbolic of the eight volumes of the Lotus Sutra. Devadatta stands for the world of hell, and the Dragon King's daughter stands for the world of Buddhahood, because what everything he was just described here is Buddhahood. Thus, together, they represent the mutual possession of the ten worlds, that is, the hundred worlds and thousand factors, or the principle of 3,000 realms in a single moment of life, the fact that Buddhahood is a present in everything. Or again, we may say that age eight represents the eight volumes of the Lotus Sutra, the eight sufferings that we undergo because of our earthly desire. We just read the definition, right? Mm -hmm. We should understand, therefore, that the attainment of Buddhahood embodied in the Lotus Sutra is symbolized by the age eight of the dragon girl. The eight sufferings are none other than the eight volumes of the Lotus Sutra. And the eight sufferings and the eight volumes are personified in the dragon girl who is eight years old. The sufferings of birth and death are nirvana. One interpretation reads the words, age eight is the opening of a jewel. The age or jewel is the single mind of the dragon girl. What's the single mind? The mind core, your original state, the, the nam yo ho ring geikyo of you, okay? That never goes away. That is eternal and without beginning, all right? One interpretation reads the word age, age, age eight as the opening of a jewel. The age or jewel is the single mind of the dragon girl, her Buddha nature, her innate Buddha nature. The eight stands for the opening of her mind to the 3,000 realms. That's what allows her to reveal it. The 3,000 realms are the eight volumes of the Lotus Sutra, which contain nam myoho renge hidden in the depths of the 16th chapter. Thus, the words age eight are representative of the opening of the door of, Bu of Buddha wisdom. Okay, mm. the age eight are representative of the opening of the door of Buddha wisdom. The passage for, uh, from the words, her wisdom has keen roots on down to the words she is capable of attaining Bodhi, described how she has accepted and taken faith in the Lotus Sutra. The words, when it comes to conceiving in mind and expounding by mouth, uh, relate to the work of the mouth or verbal actions. The words she is gentle and refined in, wo in will refer to the work of the will or mental actions. The words she has been able to accept and embrace all the storehouse of profound secrets has entered into deep meditation refer to the work of the body or physical actions. Since these three categories of action are none other than the three virtues of the Dharma body, wisdom, and emancipation, they represent the Dharma nature or the three truths. Again, we may say that the words conceiving in mind stand for, the single mo for a single moment of life. What happens in the, sixth, in the sixth stage? When at last one comes to the realization that one is a Buddha, then one is a Buddha. So how long did that take? A single moment of life. When at last, when was it gonna happen? Whenever your faith allowed it to, your karma allowed it to manifest. It wasn't anything other than that. It didn't take a certain amount of time. It could be sooner or later. It's all up to you, right? Mm -hmm. Again, again, we may say that the words conceiving in mind stand for a single moment of life and the words expounding by mouth stand for the 3,000 realms. The words has been able to accept and embrace all means you finally believe the teaching finally believe that you really are the Buddha. Mm. You've been reading it, you've been <laughs> saying it, but you've never really considered yourself mm. the thus come one mm. of perfect enlightenment, the equal of Nichiren, all right? That's the point. Yes. The Buddhahood's the same. Yes. The realization is the same. What Nichiren realizes is what he's trying to teach us to realize, mm. okay? Yes. Again, we may say that the words conceiving in mind stand for a single moment of life, and the words expounding by mouth stand for the 3,000 realms. The words has been able to accept, has been able to, finally got past that ick and accept everybody as being just like you. And to accept and embrace all, describe how the dragon girl has accepted and embraced the Lotus Sutra. 
The word age or jewel is the wish-granting jewel, namely the wonderful law. Namyo horin geiko. The, words, the, the word eight or opening reveals that the body and mind of the dragon girl are the wonderful law. Her body, her mind, it doesn't matter whether she's a girl or a dragon. Okay? It doesn't whether, might matter whether she's a male or a female. Okay? Let me finish this then. Point seven, because there's only point eight here and we're done. Point seven, point eight, actually. We got three more pages. Can you handle it? Yeah. All right. Point seven, on the passage before his words at the top of page 105. Point seven, on the passage before his words had come to an end, the dragon king's daughter suddenly appeared before the Buddha, bowed her head in obeisance, and then retired to one side, reciting these verses of praise. The record of the orally transmitted teaching says, this passage makes it perfectly clear that ignorance is none other than the Dharma nature or enlightenment. Because we start with ignorance and we transform it into enlightenment, right? They're not different. They're not two different things, okay? For that reason, before wisdom accumulated, who's a bodhisattva, but boy, he's got some attitude. He already thinks he knows it all. For that reason, before Bodhisattva wisdom accumulated, it even finished voicing his criticism of Manjushri, saying, how could that be? The dragon girl replied to him through her verses of praise in 14 lines. The viewpoint expressed in the Bodhisattva's criticism is that of the specific teaching. It's a, not of the perfect teaching. Okay, expounded specifically for bodhisattvas, which is a view characterized by ignorance, because that teaching does not allow for you to be a Buddha, become a Buddha in your present form. That's why he's going, how is that possible, Manjushri? How could you tell me that this dragon girl is like capable of, you know, Buddhahood right now? The reply of the dragon girl represents the viewpoint of the perfect teaching. She says, watch how fast, and, okay? Which is the viewpoint of the Dharma nature, the wisdom to perceive the truth that you are already the Buddha. You could have done it from the beginning or you could do it at the end of your life or you can do it in coup, I don't know. But a bottom line is that there is no point that's, it's not time related. It's karma related. Wisdom accumulated repre represents fundamental darkness or ignorance, and the dragon girl represents a woman who has realized the Dharma nature. Any woman can, any human, li any living being can. Hence, we see that ignorance is inseparable from the Dharma nature because it's just a transformation from one to the other, and that the Dharma nature is inseparable from ignorance. So having the Dharma nature doesn't suddenly make you better, okay? You have to understand that. You're still just equal. You're trying to make people have that same equal wisdom of the Dharma nature, but it doesn't eliminate ignorance from your life, mm -hmm. all right? Now when Nichiren and his followers chant nam myoho ren they represent the, the moment referred to in the sutra at, as before his words came to an end, a single moment of life. That is the moment when the previous affair, the criticism of the bodhisattva is just coming to an end. And the subsequent affair, the reply of the dragon girl is just beginning. They're the same moment. The moment then is one in which ignorance and the Dharma nature exist simultaneously. Do you follow? Mm -hmm. Such is the moment when Nam Yoho Rengekyo is chanted because we're nine, nine, uh, nine world realm, nine, nine world people, human mm -hmm. beings, okay, bringing forth the 10th world, right? Manifesting it by chanting Daimoku to the Gohonzon. So our ignorance isn't removed. We didn't suddenly become, you know, never having ignorance. That's why we're the three poisons are with us all the way to the end of our life. Okay? The reason wisdom, bodhisattva wisdom accumulated is said to represent fundamental darkness lies in the words, I cannot believe. 
because he says, I cannot believe that, you know, a little, an eight-year-old dragon could suddenly attain, be, be near perfect enlightenment. He, he qualifies that to Manjushri. I cannot believe in his statement, I cannot believe that this girl in the space of an instant could actually achieve correct enlightenment, mm. okay? Which we just qualified as the sixth stage of practice. We all have that exact same moment of life, mm. okay? Not to believe is to harbor doubt and perplexity. Mm. Now, what is perplexity? <clears throat> is to harbor, what is to harbor? To not do anything about getting rid of it. To being, being, being fine with not understanding. To not ha have the seeking spirit that you don't, you, you gotta get rid of your doubt. You, you, you take the actions that eliminate the doubt. Actually transform the doubt into Buddhahood, mm -hmm. okay? So not to believe is to harbor doubt and perplexity, what is perplexity? Gosh, I can't just, I just can't figure that out. That's just over my head. Okay, perplexity would mean that you would just accept the fact that you don't understand. Okay, you harbor perplexity. You don't get rid of the perplexity. You don't transform it through study, through mastering the teaching. You just listen to words from others and think that that's good enough. And you're not given permission to think that way. There's nothing that says that's, that's okay. And doubt and perplexity are symbol, symptomatic of fundamental darkness or ignorance because only an ignorance would think that way. Only ignorance would allow doubt to be harbored. Only ignorance would not be curious to get rid of perplexity, okay? The reason the dragon girl is said to represent the Dharma nature or enlightenment is a passage in which she says, I unfold the doctrine of the great vehicle to rescue living beings from suffering. She takes on the mission of the Buddha in that moment as an eight-year-old girl in order to teach wisdom accumulated the truth. As for the dragon girl, her father is a dragon and she is his eight-year-old daughter. The two words dragon girl imply that both father and daughter attain Buddhahood at the same time, which is what I've been saying over and over about our moms and dads, okay? When we attain Buddhahood, so do they, all right? That is why the passage says, then the dragon king's daughter suddenly appeared before the Buddha. Since it is said that she is the dragon king's daughter, we know that the dragon king is her father and she is his eight-year-old daughter. Thus, the daughter is shown attaining Buddhahood in this chapter, while the attainment of Buddhahood by her father, the Dragon King, has already been implied in the introduction chapter, as seen in the passage that says that, at the assembly at which the Lotus Sutra was preached, there were eight Dragon Kings. That means he never left the assembly. He wasn't a part of the 5,000 uh, uh, you know, our hots that left. He's a dragon king, okay? He's a disciple of Manjushri, actually. However, we may say that both father and daughter attained Buddha simultaneously since the introduction chapter serves as an introduction to all the chapters of the Lotus Sutra. So he says, because there's really no separation for, between any of the chapters, they're all leading to the truth that I'm going to reveal as the Namyo Horin Gekyo, the true aspect of all phenomena, okay? And have, and thus, pardon me, and having heard his teaching, I have attained Bodhi, chapter 12. These are the words of the dragon girl when she rebukes a wisdom accumulated. And therefore she goes on to say that only the Buddha can testify to this fact. And having heard his teaching, I have attained Bodhi. This is a quote from the, from the, from the chapter. The Buddha alone can bear witness to this, she says. When she speaks of rescuing living beings from suffering, however, she is speaking of rescuing women in particular. The verses of praise in 14 lines express the doctrine of 3,000 realms in a single moment of life. The words he profoundly understood, he, which he's talking about, she, he had turned, she had turned into a man, okay? Right. He's gonna qualify that that isn't really what it means. 
But the words of the sutra say, he profoundly understands the signs of guilt and good fortune and illuminates the 10 directions everywhere, refers to the 10 worlds. This passage on how the eight-year-old dragon girl attained Buddhahood is particularly noteworthy because it refers to the ancestors of the rulers who uphold the Lotus Sutra. The first human sovereign of Japan was Emperor Jimu. Emperor Jimu was the son of Ugayafuki Aizu no Mikoto, the fifth of the five generations of earthly, de of earthly deities. The mother of uh, Ugayafuki Aizu no Mikoto was Princess Toyotama, the daughter of the dragon, of the dragon king Sagaira, and an elder sister of the eight-year-old dragon girl. Therefore, we know that the ancestors of the rulers of, rulers of Japan were votaries of the Lotus Sutra, a fact of profound significance, a fact of profound significance. Therefore, this one chapter titled Devadatta is a vital sword to be, born at, to be worn at the waist everywhere throughout the world. This truth and understanding, it is a secret law to cut down the foes of ignorance and earthly desires and to sever the bonds of birth and death, longing and attachment. Emperor Keotsu, founder of the Han Dynasty, had his three-foot sword, but it cannot compare to this one-word sword of wisdom, Myo, or wonderful. The one-word sword of wisdom can sever the bonds of birth and death and earthly desires. Devadatta represents fiery flames. The dragon girl represents a giant reptile. And Manjushri Shri represents the sword of wisdom. And orally transmitted teaching says that all these three elements are represented in the form of the wisdom king immovable. It's on the Gohonzon. The fire and the flames surrounding him, the reptile in, uh, uh, in the dragon that winds itself around his sword and the sword of wisdom in the sword he holds. Devadatta also represents the principle that our earthly desires are none other than enlightenment. The dragon girl represents the principle that the sufferings of birth and death are none other than nirvana. The name Manjushri can be translated as wonderful virtue. This wonderful virtue contains within it both earthly desires and the sufferings of birth and death. In this chapter, it serves as the element that acts to convert others to the truth. Point eight, this is the last one. At the bottom of page 107, point eight on the passage, at that time, the dragon girl had a precious jewel worth as much as a thousand million fold world or a major world system, which she presented to the Buddha. The Buddha immediately accepted it. The dragon girl said to wit, Bodhisattva wisdom accumulated and to the venerable one, Sheri Putra, I presented the precious jewel uh, and the world honored one accepted, accepted it. Was that not done quickly? They replied, very quickly. The girl said, employ your supernatural powers and watch me attain Buddhahood. It will be even quicker than that. Oh, what a badass. Volume eight. It would, only, it would take a woman to say that. Volume eight of the words and phrases says, first, the presentation of the jewel symbolizes the attainment of perfect understanding. The record of the orally transmitted teaching says, that would have volume eight of words and phrases, Tentai would have said, first, the presentation of the jewel symbolizes the attainment of perfect understanding. The perfect understanding is nam myoho mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So the record of the orally transmitted teaching says, in the phrase, a precious jewel, the word A or one indicates myoho rengekyo, abbreviated as myoho, or the wonderful law. Precious indicates the workings of the wonderful law and the jewel indicates the entity of the wonderful law. Because it is myo or wonderful, it embodies the element of the mind. And because it is ho or law, it embodies the element of form or the body. The, the body phenomena are the jewel and the mind potentials are the precious element in it. The words wonderful law indicate that body and mind are not two different entities, okay? Did you get all that? Let me say it again real quick. In the phrase, a precious jewel, the word A or one indicates myoho rengekyo, which is us. 
Precious indicates the workings of the wonderful law. And the jewel indicates the entity when we are when we have embraced that precious jewel, okay, or indicates the workings of the wonderful law, and the jewel indicates the entity of the wonderful law. We're the jewel, mm. the mind jewel, the mind king. Mm. Because it is myo or wonderful, our original state, okay? Because it is myo or wonderful, it is, which is also mystic, it embodies the element of the mind, which is always the same. And because it is ho or the law, it embodies the element or form of the body because mind and body cannot appear separately. The body phenomena <clears throat> are the jewel and the mind potentials because it's up to you whether you bring forth that mind king of nam yo gekyo mm. Okay, yeah, you got a body, but have you awakened this? It's, but without the body, this can't be awakened. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Okay. The body phenomena are the jewel and the mind potentials are the precious element in it. Nam yo gekyo the words wonderful law indicate that mind and body are not two different entities because they can't be separated. They can't exist separately. Expressing the principle of 3,000 realms in a single moment of life, the dragon girl presents the precious jewel to the Buddha. When words and phrases, when Tantai says that this symbolizes the attainment of perfect understanding, it is referring to the principle of 3,000 realms in a single moment of life, but the theoretical one. At that time, when the precious jewel was still in the hands of the dragon girl, it, presented, it represented the attainments that were inherent in her nature. Her, her, the, pot, the, the fact that she already had the capacity to, be, to, to bring forth and awaken these, this precious contents. This precious contents pre precede her attainment. Okay, your original estate precedes the sixth stage in a single life, in a single moment of life, right? So the nam myoho rengekyo was already there. You didn't create it when you realized that realization, okay? That's what he's clarifying. It represented the attainments that were inherent in her nature. But when the Buddha accepted the precious jewel, it became representative of the attainments acquired through religious practice. That's the six stages, okay? Herein is embodied the principle that acquired through practice and inherent in nature are not two different things. The nam myoho rengekyo has always been there, but your actions are what make it manifest and come forth. Do you understand? Okay, we're all on the same page on that one. The words very quickly at the very bottom of page 108. The words very quickly represent the doctrine of sudden fulfillment, sudden and swift attainment, or sudden enlightenment, which is stage six, okay? When, at last, okay? The same idea is expressed in the passage in the chapter 11 of the Lotus Sutra that reads, this way one will quickly attain the unsurpassed Buddha way. In the term gene riki or supernatural powers, the word gene or supernatural represents the element of the mind and the word riki or powers represents the element of the body. We'll get to that. When the dragon girl says, watch me attain Buddhahood, Sherry Putra thinks that she is only refer that she is referring only to her own attainment of Buddhahood. But this is an error, error because he's only a bodhisattva. That's as much as he can see it as. She is rebuking him by saying, watch how one attains Buddhahood. All of us Buddhas attain Buddhahood this way. The word khan or watch refers to the khan of the six stages of practice, which I've been talking about over and over again, of Tentai's great concentration and insight. Here one should understand it is pertaining to the con or perception that is represented in the second of the six stages, the stage of hearing in the, the name and the words of the truth. Why is that significant? Because you're only a, you're a Buddha in theory in stage one. Hearing the name and the words of the truth is what awakens and transforms you into a thus come one eventually at stage six, right? Therefore, as soon as one Hears Nam Yoho Rengekyo, 
one has, uh, as volume eight of words and phrases says in speaking of the dragon girl, without a doubt sat for a moment in the place of practice and thus attained Buddhahood. When you hear nam myoho rengekyo you have awakened the process that will ultimately manifest as Buddhahood. It's impossible for it not to. And it will continue in every lifetime once it has. When the sutra says that the members of the assembly saw the dragon girl change into a man, it means that the dragon girl's original state, that of a dragon girl, was already in the state of nam myoho rengekyo This idea is brought out very clearly in this passage of the sutra. It has nothing to do with turning into a man. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.